Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for coming out. Uh, my name is Eric Dawson. I'm the manager of the Calvin and McClellan Historical Collection. And uh, we're presenting this series of programming with our partners here at the East Tennessee Historical Society and uh, today the Knoxville History Project. And uh, we're doing a series of programs based around our exhibit in the Temporary Gallery, the Lights, Camera, East Tennessee, the History of Film in East Tennessee. Uh, there's some other programming coming up. I want to let you know about that's going to take place here on Saturday, February 25th. Uh, Daytonia Mitchell will be leading a workshop on conducting African American genealogy. That's from 1 to 3, and uh, it's going to be an auditorium. Uh, be sure and, and come out for that. It'll be a really interesting and uh, neat subject. And then getting into March, uh, March 14th, we're going to have a history of houses, how to do research on the houses. Uh, there's been more demand for that lately, as you can imagine, given all the people moving. Uh, to this region and the real estate boom. So uh, that's going to be upstairs in the classroom. You can register for that online. And on March 15th, we're going to have another in our series of programming based around the exhibit. And that's going to be an introduction to the Tennessee Archive of Moving Image and Sound, which is the AV portion, audiovisual portion of the McClung Collection, and where a lot of the materials for the exhibit came. But today we're going to take a look at um, African American theaters in Knoxville segregated area. And we're really uh, happy that uh, to have a two uh, really esteemed and knowledgeable people to speak of that. Mr. Robert J. Booker, who, uh, of course, that firsthand experience and talk about his time uh, going to Bijou, the Gem, other theaters. And then Jack Neely from the Knoxville History Project, who will be uh, leading conversation with him. So thank you all for coming, and let's welcome. Thanks everybody for coming out, and, and I'm much honored to, to be here uh, and, and grateful that that, uh, that, that Robert uh, stepped away from his uh, long-threatened retirement to, uh, to, to, uh, to, to, to honor us with his presence, because uh, this, this uh, would not be an, a very authentic presentation without him. Um, but we're, uh, uh, he's it shared his, his fascination with movies as a child with, uh, with me many times before. Uh, Bob is, by the way, the uh, one of the founding board members of the Knoxville History Project, but uh, that's uh, not not necessarily the most uh, uh, historic of his accomplishments, uh, have, having been uh, a, a leader of the uh, civil rights movement in the early 1960s here. He later became a historian of that movement and of black culture in Knoxville in general, and has served uh, on several uh, several uh, public uh, 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 seats uh, over the years uh, in, the, in uh, the state legislature and later in Austin City Council uh, and was a longtime leader of the Beck Cultural Exchange Center uh, as well. But uh, there's a particular irony about talking about movies and uh, and the black experience uh, because motion pictures were uh, came to the fore in the 1890s basically and, and as I've learned uh, one thing I learned from the great exhibit this uh, just down the hall is that the first, I've heard some rumors about early motion pictures being shown here in the 1890s on sheets outside at the old Turner Park on the north side of town. Uh, but the earliest known uh, motion picture event we know of was shown just down the street, about a block down the street, uh, when a, a company uh, showed uh, some short, very short motion pictures in 1895. Uh, well, what else happened in the 1890s? That was also, uh, the following year was a Supreme Court judgment, uh, Plessy versus Ferguson, which allowed uh, all, all uh, states that were inclined to to, uh, to pull the hammer down on, on segregation, which had been uh, kind of something that existed before, but was never codified in law uh, in, in such a way. There was no such thing as a white theater in Knoxville in the 19th century. That came in the 1920s, which is especially ironic in a way, when everything else was becoming modern and the movies were becoming, were becoming, uh, were becoming extremely popular. Uh, but, uh, but, uh, but Bob, do you have anything to add about that? It's, it's, it's ironic in a way that motion picture, and, and we've seen that in recent years in Hollywood, uh, demonstrations about, uh, about who gets Oscars and so forth, uh, but motion pictures uh, align perfectly with this uh, this this codified uh, racial uh, uh, categorizing in, in America that that was completely unequal and, and uh, left often left black people out of the out of the game both as as uh, as actors and as spectators. Uh, but is that your your 
your impression, and I don't miss anything about that era of the 1890s and that, um, that irony. Well, yes, of course, you know, the first Academy Award was, Academy Award program was conducted in 1927 and really took until 1939 for a black person to win an Academy Award when Hattie McDaniel won for her role as Mammy in Gone with the Wind. And of course, that was quite interesting to watch her on the screen perform. And even when the movie premiered in Atlanta and when the uh, awarded the awards. Had McDaniel was not invited, you know, so that was very, a very sad situation. Yeah. But we, we've come a long way since then. You know, I, I've been a movie buff, I guess, for a very long time. My grandmother would take me to the gym theater when I was eight years old. She was interested in horror movies, and every Tuesday, <laughs> She had to go see Frankenstein, the Wolfman, the Mummy, Dracula, and she didn't want to go by herself, so she took eight-year-old me. And there I sat watching that stuff. I don't know how I reacted on the outside, but on the inside I was terrified <laughs> to watch Dr. Frankenstein work his magic. And to top it all off, when we left the movie theater, we had to walk by the Johnny Ben and Son Mortuary. <laughs> and I just knew some of those bodies that Dr. Frankenstein had worked on was in the Johnny and his This was an 18-year-old I'm talking about. I'm an eight-year-old mind that I'm talking about. And then by the time I was 10, my mother began to take me to see movies that she liked. Leave Her to Heaven, uh, Love Story and all that stuff. And the movie Sister Kenny that had to do with infantile paralysis. I think Sister Kenny played the part of an Australian nurse who dealt with young people in our lungs. And of course, that was terrifying too. I was <laughs> 10 years old and having to watch somebody breathe in an iron lung. Finally, there was some relief when I was 11, uh, 11 years old and I could go to the movies on my own, and suddenly there was Johnny Mac Brown and Tim McCoy and Buck Jones and Al Lash LaRue and Hopalong Cassidy, guys riding their horses and drinking in saloons, except for Hopalong Cassidy, he drank sarsaparilla, <laughs> alcohol. But what I didn't know, Jack, at the time was that there was a black cowboy. There was a black cowboy, Herb Jeffries, who was a big band singer, who had made four black westerns, uh, The Bronze Buckaroo, Harlem Rides the Rains, Two Gun Man from Harlem, and Harlem on the Prairie, which <laughs> let you know this was a black cowboy. <laughs> but they were gone by the time I was able to go to the gym theater by myself. So I had to see those movies later on and to be able to look at movies in general to judge how blacks had been treated in movies. And, and then we saw the cracking of the ice in 1949 with, with some of the stuff that real, that told real black stories. Yeah. But, but prior to that time, Blacks were buffoons and chauffeurs and butlers and people like Mantan Mullen who starred with Charlie Chan. And every time you mention a ghost, there's all eyes all but popped out because that's how Hollywood portrayed black people in those days uh, before the early 1950s when Sidney Poitier came on the scene. Yeah, yeah, there were white buffoons too, but <laughs> the difference was that there weren't any any black people in, in heroic roles or, yeah. in, or, in, or in complex in, dramatic roles in, until, indeed. until later. Indeed. Um, but uh, but I want to talk about how, how black cinema evolved here in town. Uh, it, it's uh, really interesting to uh, talk about how cinema evolved. Uh, by 1900 or so, the turn of the century, there were uh, like Penny arcades or whatever you could watch some movies. You could you could watch there were so much show, short movies as a novelty at vaudeville shows and uh, just very short films of a train or a, or, or even of of the execution of Leon Zolgos in, in, in 1901, uh, the assassin of uh, of, uh, of McKinley. 
uh, but uh, but there were uh, and they showed in some of the in some of the rowdy houses or what they called them down on Central. They, this is where we think we're one of the first places that show movies regularly. Uh, and there weren't many movie theaters until the early 20th century, and uh, one of the very first ones is fascinating to me was o opened by a guy who was raised in slavery, uh, Cal Johnson, in 1907. Uh, opened a movie theater on on Central Street, and he was. He was uh, in late middle age at this time. You don't think of people his age as being uh, up, up, to, up to date with, uh, with the latest technology, but he was apparently interested in the idea of motion pictures in 1907. He was, what, uh, how was it, 60, 60 something years old at the time. And, uh, but opened this place called the Lincoln Theater down in what we know as the Old City area. And, uh, and we don't, I, I wish I knew more about this. We have a, a few slides we're gonna show later. We, we have an early, uh, yeah, here we go. Here's an early, uh, uh, early ad for it, and the the ads that you see in the papers were mostly aimed at white people, uh, and uh, so we don't know, and uh, for sure what they did on a regular basis, what they were showing there for for black audiences, but this was a, a live show uh, for uh, for uh, for uh, I think both races uh, that shown in Cal Johnson's uh, movie theater, and this is the same Cal Johnson that had a chain of saloons and had uh, the course their horse racing track on uh, on the east side of town uh, but this uh, a remarkable uh, business story in Knoxville history is, is that of, of Cal Johnson this this theater lasted uh, I think only three or four years uh, it named it the Lincoln Theater the Great Emancipator I guess was the inspiration for that and that may have been the reason why the Lincoln Theater was uh, a gathering place for early black Republicans I found a few black Republican clubs would meet at the Lincoln Theater in, uh, in, in that, that era but uh, but in fact, I would love to find out more about this. I think we only know from a, a few scant ads and, and listings in City Directory about this. Do you know anything else about the Lincoln Theater? No, I don't because it was shot live. But what is always interesting to me, that very last, the bottom of the, the slide there, no, no matter what blacks were doing in town, any kind of in, entertainment, they always made sure there were seats reserved for white spectators. And that always, uh, got me to read that phrase in, in the advertisement. Whether it was at Chillawee Park, whether it was at the gym theater for a wrestling match or whatever, they, yeah. they, they yeah. made seating available. It's, and they did it in different ways. Some places they had, I think, probably had a segregated section uh, in, in, in South Chillawee Park, they did it in the balcony, just, <clears> just <throat> kind of reversed the assumptions about what they used to do in churches and things that would have the white people in the balcony. Well, you, you know, what's interesting to me, I, in 1950, I was a sophomore at Austin High School, and they showed the movie Hamlet at the Pike Theater. Now, this had won the Academy Award in 1948. And the city school board of somebody in position said, our high school kids ought to see this movie because it's real Shakespeare. So they decided to show it at the Pike Theater. Pike Theater on Kingston Pike, Pike, which was later the Capri. Later the Capri. And, yeah. and what they did, they put a rope up the center aisle and all the black kids sat on one side of the theater and the white kids sat on the other side of the theater. And, and, and that's interesting, that vertical the separation rather than uh, the other way um, is, uh, is I, I've seen that a few times in the 19th century, I think if I'm not mistaken, when Frederick Douglass spoke at Todd's Opera House, was uh, they had white people on one side and black on the other, and with a rope down the middle. Well, uh, uh, you know, that was 1881, and I've always been curious about that arrangement, but I, I never did know. But that, that was similar to the popular restaurant in the old city, the New York Cafe. What they did, they built a counter in the center of the restaurant, Black people ate on one side of the counter and white people ate on the other side. So we had a way of sharing, but we did it uh, yeah, without but, mixing. And that was run by Greek immigrants. So uh, they, they just got here and we were just trying to figure out how to make some money on this. And this is how they tried to figure, reckon with, uh, with American segregation. But uh, um, anyway, yeah, uh, but we, we had the, the uh, uh, Lincoln Theater, which, and, and there were a couple of other black theaters that came and went in the early days, but the best known of them was the gym. And, uh, yeah, yeah, we had the Iola, which came about the same time, a little bit before the Lincoln. And of course, in Mechanicsville, they had one called the Booker T Theater, 
It had been the Ritz, it had been the Sunset, it had several different names. But in 1946, they decided to build a brand new black theater on South Central, the Grand. And I went to the Grand a number of times, but uh, the business just wasn't there, so the Grand closed. And how, how, how grand was it? How big a theater was it? Well, it, it was a fairly large, maybe it would hold 500 people, I guess. And it went out of business oh, within 10 years, and it became an automobile shop. So the Grand Theater, which was our newest theater, went, went out of business for lack of patronage. Yeah. Yeah. Well, tell us about the gym. Uh, it was uh, it, it actually it moved a little bit. It was the uh, it, it's hard to believe that the the first gym is in a building that's still standing today on uh, on West uh, Summit Hill. It was then West Vine, and it was a uh, it was uh, it was it was a a, a a theater for black people during the silent era in the nineteen. 20s. Well, 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 it was built in 1913, 1913 on the yeah. west side of the street. And in 1920, they built the Dixie Theater, which was a fabulous uh, uh, theater complex for black people. And for some reason, the Dixie went out of business about 1922, and the Jim Theater moved into the Dixie building. Uh, it was it held uh, more than 2,000 people. Okay. Okay. And, wow, that, that's a big thing. It, it was, and it, they had a basement section where they had wrestling matches and boxing matches and all kinds of things. And so in addition to the movies, they had stage shows and, and all of these uh, sporting activities and, as well. And, and this was the same building that was later the gym that was built over First Creek, is that the one? Uh, or built over First Creek. First Creek did a loop at the corner of Willow and Central, because you know where that is. First Creek ran parallel with Willow, ran under Central, under those businesses on the west side of Central, looped back across near the gym theater, and ran under the gym theater. And those of us who went to the gym theater on a, on a hot summer day could smell the creek of the, coming up through the floorboards of the gym. The gym what, what had an unusual construction. When you walked in the front door, the screen was at the front, so you had to walk by the screen to get to your seat. And you saw everybody who came in and you saw everybody who left. So no one could sneak in with a lady that was not his own without being seen. So, and, and not only, they, they had a great concession stand in the gym theater, but they also had these salesmen who walked the floor crying popcorn, candy, cold drinks. And of course, during my period, when I went, I could get in for a dime. And if I had a quarter, I could buy a cold drink, a nickel rock candy bar, and a bag of popcorn, all for a quarter. Now you pay five bucks for a bag of popcorn. So uh, those were great days for me with a quarter. Yeah, 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 that's part of the business plan. Yeah, if you, if you want a picture where the gym was, it's about where the dog park is now, the, the, uh, the, uh, on the corner of uh, Summit Hill and Central. And it was on the, on the uh, on the east side of, of Summerville, uh, but facing uh, what's now what's now Summerville Drive and and Bob Booker Bridge there. It right? was right. just at the beginning of the yeah. Robert J. Booker yeah. Bridge, <laughs> <laughs> and I, you know when they named that bridge for me, I thought about it. I said, "Gee, this is where I saw my first movie." The Colorado Drugstore was on the other end where I had my first milkshake. Further up the street was the Carnegie Library where I read my first book. So I said, this is quite becoming that they named that bridge after me. Yeah, it was kind of a cultural center. What, and Nikki Giovanni, remember the Carter Arbus Road store and the jukebox that she discovered jazz and lots of things yeah. in the jukebox at uh, Carter Roberts. Well, yeah. so something else that was interesting about the gym theater, and I, I thought about this only recently. Urban Renewal came through and destroyed every black business in that area, all 107 of them except for the gym theater. And I didn't think about why the gym theater was left standing until just recently. 
And then I was sure, I haven't read any minutes, I haven't heard anybody say, but I believe somebody in authority said, we better not take the gym theater. Because if we do, all of those people will be wanting to go to the Tennessee and the Louisiana. <laughs> hey. Well, what they didn't know was that our city and movement had brought about the segregation of downtown lunch counters and movie theaters. The Jim Theater lost all of its business and closed in 1965. So we went to the Riviera and the Tennessee anyway, <laughs> even though they tried to keep us at the Jim Theater. Yeah, yeah. Well, we have we, we we have some images of the gym to show uh, to show later. Uh, but uh, 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 what what do you think of? Uh, well, during this time, uh, of course, the the Bijou Theater opened uh, in 1909, and this was two years after uh, Cal Johnson's Lincoln Theater down there. But the, the Bijou Theater, of course, was a, a bigger theater and was open. Uh, Open segregated. It was uh, it was uh, a, 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 a white people would sit in the orchestra and, and, and black people would sit in the usually in the second balcony. I've found a few occasions where the uh, black people sat in, in the first balcony as well. But uh, but the the Bijou was kind of Knoxville's main theater, mainly for vaudeville and Broadway shows. And it's uh, it's it's interesting. The very first uh, we yeah we have a we have a picture. This is supposedly taken. Uh, uh, the the day of the the night of the opening of the, of the Bijou Theater in 1909, and the uh, the attraction at the Bijou that night was uh, a, a Broadway show by George M. Cohan called Little Johnny Jones. Little Johnny uh, Jones, and that's uh, we don't recognize that name so much as some of the songs that were introduced in that musical, including uh, Give My Regards to Broadway and uh, Yankee Doodle Dandy, were both from that from that one show. And uh, this was about four years after it debuted in Broadway, and, and I, I, I thought, well, that's it was an old, old show then, but not really, if you think about it. <laughs> Hamilton is across the street, and it's eight years old, and it's still a great sensation in Knoxville. So this was a big deal in Knoxville in 1909 to open Little Johnny Jones uh, at the uh, at the at the Bijou Theater. It was about a horse uh, horse jockey uh, uh, who went to. Uh, uh, England, and uh, I haven't seen the whole show, but it's uh, it's an interesting uh, kind of interesting cultural artifact. Uh, but it had uh, there were both black and white people interested in this, and if you look very closely at this uh, at this at this picture taken from the uh, from the stage, and is it true that Jim Thompson took this picture? I think that Jim Thompson, famous photographer, got out there with his big camera and just took a big flash picture of the audience. And uh, if you look very closely at the uh, second balcony, uh, I don't know if, if we're not sure that everybody up there is is black, but there are black people on the second on the second balcony watching uh, watching this uh, first show ever shown at the uh, at the Bijou Theater. It was mainly a, a, a theater for uh, Broadway and vaudeville, traveling Broadway and vaudeville shows, uh, uh, but also began showing movies by uh, by the 1920s or so. And it was always uh, it was always uh, uh, always segregated, uh, but always open to both races. And, uh, and Bob has, has personal memories of, of, uh, of the Bijou Theater. Uh, you want to share, share some of those? Well, I didn't see too many movies at the gym because I'm mean, at the Bijou because I was going to the gym. But on occasion, I did go. There was a movie I wanted to see, and I, I went there because it wasn't going to be shown at the gym. One of the things I do remember when I was 14 years old, we moved from my old neighborhood down in the bottom to a neighborhood closer to Magnolia Avenue, and I played with a bunch of white boys in that uh, community. In fact, we, we in that neighborhood, we, we built a clubhouse and we would play in the clubhouse. It was four concrete walls that had been part of a basement. We put a top on it. And one day we were playing and somebody said, let's go see a movie. And sure enough, we walked down Depot Avenue to Gate Street to the Bijou. And they went in the front door of the theater and I went up what I call the fire escape. I have no better description of the black entrance to the Bijou than being a fire escape. Went up and saw the movie, and when the movie was over, we got back together in front of the theater and walked back to the neighborhood. We made no plans for that. How we went to the Bijou, I don't know, but it was understood that all of us could go to the Bijou, so that's where we went. 
But uh, it was interesting to sit up in that balcony and it wasn't a bad seat because really when I go to the opera at uh, the Tennessee Theater, I prefer to sit in the balcony. I'm sitting on the floor. And, well, the, the, the same is kind of, well, well, you don't get the, the panoramic view from the art from the balcony. Um, I mean, you get that from the balcony, but you don't get it from the main floor. So, yeah. my, my memories are not that clear about the Bijou because I didn't go that much. Yeah. Well, I, I should mention the Bijou Theater is uh, they're renovating the second balcony, which since the 70s has been used only for lighting and technical stuff up there. Uh, but they're uh, they're going to try to restore it and reopen it for audience audiences and and they're going to be very uh, 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 deliberate in their intention to try to interpret the black experience on the in the second balcony and, and Bob has, has been helpful with that uh, with that research um, but uh, but it was uh, that was it was it was a theater open to both both races today we look gosh they were segregated that's unfair but but then again it was not like the Tennessee and Nervi era which were simply all white theaters they were they were uh, not, they didn't allow black people to walk in the door um, unless they worked there um, so uh, it was uh, uh, but the, the Bijou was like that but also the old uh, lyric was like that uh, across the street was the lyric which was even larger than the Bijou theater. And it was the old Stobbs Opera House, and it was they showed uh, movie. It was later a Lowe's movie theater in the 1920s, and but it was uh, it was a segregated theater, and uh, was uh, I think ended ended as a as a, as a segregated uh, wrestling uh, venue uh, in the 1950s. It was torn down in 1956 before the the civil rights uh, the effective civil rights movement. Um, but uh, but anyway, you, you, you told me you didn't you don't have any memories of going to the lyric. No, I never went to the lyric at all. You know, I, it became the lyric in 1922 after yeah. I'd been installed yeah. all those years. But I, I you know I saw the ads for the wrestling matches and whatever. But I wasn't interested in wrestling, so I certainly didn't go. And consequently, never set foot in that theater at, at all. Yeah. yeah. One other thing about the Bijou I want to mention is that they uh, I, I found it kind of an awkward. Uh, uh, set of announcements and ads in the mid-1950s when there was a new movie uh, with Dorothy Dandridge and, uh, and uh, 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 who else? Uh, Mahalia Jackson. Was in, no, Pearl Bailey was in it, uh, but called Carmen Jones. And it was, a, uh, it was, a, it was an all-black cast interpretation of the opera Carmen uh, in, in English. Yeah, with Harry Belafonte. Harry Belafonte was yeah. in it too, that's right. And, uh, and uh, it was announced for the Tennessee Theater, and then oddly, uh, they they stopped talking about it being at the Tennessee Theater, and uh, because the Tennessee Theater was all white in 1955, 56 when it came out, and then they announced it for the Bijou Theater, and that was that was uh, uh, I, I think that was to allow uh, they knew that there'd be a lot of black interest in this movie, and uh, I, you know wanted to, wanted to maximize ticket ticket sales, I guess, but. Uh, but thought the Bijou would be a better place, uh, a better place for it. Well, well, I saw it in England. I was courtesy of Uncle Sam. I saw it in a unsegregated theater in <laughs> England, so I, I didn't see it here in yeah. Oxford. Yeah, I wish it, it's a fascinating movie to watch if you haven't seen it. Is, it is. I, I have a copy of it in my collection. <laughs> but uh, uh, and inter interestingly enough. Th those people were professional singers, but somebody else did the singing for them, both Harry Belafonte and for Dorothy Dandridge. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, somebody else did the singing wow. for wow. them. Wow. But, uh, but I just can't imagine, we can only imagine that the, you know, the back, backstage discussions, gosh, we have this all black cast theater showing in an all white theater. Uh, what, what are we, uh, is this really a great idea? And they, I think they finally. Well, you know, Jack, that happened one other time. There was a theater on Gay Street, I'm, I'm forgetting the uh, name of it now, but there was an all-black movie that was a musical, and they needed the right sound to present this picture, and the gym theater at the time didn't have the equipment, so they had it at the all-white theater on Gay Street. And then and later on, when the gym theater was well-equipped with the sound, the, the movie did come to the gym theater. So we've had all kinds of mixing and mingling sometimes with, with, with our movies that, that were unintended, I guess you might say. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, we have some, uh, some more images. Of, uh, Paul, you want to show some more? Here's, here's a picture of the gym theater. We have several of them, and we're kind of puzzling over the, uh, 
they're, I think they're mostly dated 19, uh, well, this is 1921. This is a really early, and this was, I guess, just when it was, when it became the, uh, the gym or, or what? That's what I said. It was the Dixie because it was yeah. the Dixie sign up there. And by this time, it, it, somewhere in 1921 or thereabouts, it became the gym rather than the Dixie. Yeah, yeah. And it was, it was a first class building. They really uh, built this building to, to do a lot of things with it. Yeah, and, and think this is the uh, first creek is flowing underneath the, this building. Now. And notice the traffic control tower up there. Yeah. This was yeah. before we had all the <laughs> street lights. And there were about 10 or 12 of these traffic boxes across the yeah. city where a policeman would sit up in the box. You see a copper up there operating <laughs> the lights depending on the traffic flow at the corner line in Central at the time. To, to turn on the red lights and the, the green lights and, and whatever. Yeah. yeah, it looks like that might be a barber shop down there with the striped pole, I'm guessing. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. next one. Okay. 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 Yeah, I, I had never seen this before. You know something about this. I, I, was, I was impressed. I'd always heard rumors about Mamie Smith, who was the first, the first black woman to record on, right. to make records and at jazz records in those early days. That's right, she was, and, and on my radio show, I played that record that, that she did. And, and tell us about your radio show. Are you still doing it? Well, yes, I, I have a radio show in Nobia, KGN, every Thursday and Saturday. Thursdays from 1 to 3, Saturdays from 10 to 12. And, and sometimes I feature music like this, and a big band also. I play music from the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And, and one day I featured Mamie Smith to talk about her visit. Uh, to the gym theater and, and that, that crazy blues song that was her big hit that made her the first black woman uh, recording artist. Yeah. And again, that last note, special section reserved for white people. That's always interesting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I could probably sing crazy blues, but I don't think I wanted to. All right, uh, next one, please. All right, they also had some wrestling uh, there. And, uh, you know, Westergaard, uh, Bob Ali, I'd love to, to know where, you know, were these both black guys wrestling? Do, you know, do we know about these guys? Uh, well, I think so, for the most part, they were. <coughs> they had a lot of this at the gym theater during that period of time. And, and at, at, and at Stalks as well. Yeah, next one, please. All right. Yeah, Frolics of 1934, and again, this is a little bit different kind of segregation. Uh, rather than having sections, they had a midnight show for white people uh, after the after the the main show for black people. But uh, this was a live, uh, I think, a live show uh, of uh, Reuben Reeves and his Piece Orchestra. Mm -hmm. Butter beans and Susie. <laughs> Regular shows matinee night, colored only. Colored only for the regular, but this was a special deal. Yeah. 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 Next one, please. Well, one, one thing, Jack, I, I think those people who put those things on wanted to make sure that the white community understood what was going on with the black community, entertainment-wise, culture-wise, so they tried to share as much as they could about black culture in Mount and, and, and the reason. And it wasn't just uh, just trying to, 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 to reach out to, to black culture. This was jazz and, and blues were the new kinds of American music. This yeah. is the most exciting thing happening in America. That's why we call the jazz age in the yeah. 1920s. Yeah. So uh, naturally they wanted to catch up. Yeah. Earl Father Hines, I, I play a lot of his music on my show. He was one of those band leaders of, of the past, who, who was top notch, almost as, uh, as top notch as uh, Count Basie and Duke Ellington. Yeah. And he, he, and, he rated right up there. And, and it's remarkable that he played here a lot. Uh, uh, and this was not just at the Jam Theater, he played a, a series of shows. He like uh, for two weeks at the Riviera Theater, the all white Riviera yeah. Theater. He did yeah. shows, it was yeah. almost like the Cotton Club in New York, which well, was all. The music was kind of colorblind, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, 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 yeah. But he played at places in Mechanicsville now and then. Yeah. I don't know if he had friends here or what, but he played here almost every year for a long period of time when not everybody did in those days. But uh, yeah. All right. Harlem Broadcast. Um. 
truck. I, I don't. I don't think that they they grateful dead trucking. They're talking about. <laughs> um, but uh, and but the Haley Selassie stop that uh, that's fascinating. Connecting to uh, to uh, the, I don't know if the, the Rosto thing has something to do with that or what. Well, you know who Haley Selassie was? He was the president of Ethiopia, yeah. uh, the ruler of Ethiopia, and, uh, and and considered that more than that by some by some people. But uh, yeah. But, uh, all right. Yeah, here's a uh, later picture of the gem. Uh, it, it, and some of these pictures look kind of run down, and some of it was all freshened up. So I guess we're catching on both uh, on both sides. Well, it it burned down in 1942. Yeah, and uh, it was rebuilt because as a that my grandmother would take me every Tuesday and, and I said, Mom, are we going to the movies? She said, no, lightning struck it oh. and destroyed it. So he said, so rebuilt. You remember the, the earlier one and the and the later one? That's right. Yeah. 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 Lightning struck it in 1942. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. This, uh, the movie showing it is uh, Nancy Steele is missing, and that's a, it's a kind of a, 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 a B mystery from that era. I think it's a white cast movie, but they watched almost everything at the gym, it sounds like. Yeah, here we go. And kidnapped. All right, this, this is the interior of the gym, right? Does that look like uh, your memories of it, or do you? No. That's a, no, that, this, as I said, it was redone, and it looks there like the screen is at the back rather than at the front, so I'm not sure. I'm not sure about that. It was an interesting seat, though. Yeah. Yeah, that's not recognizable to me at all. Yeah. Dogtown Scandals, they would come up with all kinds of titles to get people to come in uh, to see those show a ramble. And this is especially, especially interesting if you look at who the uh, star is uh, featuring, Ida Cox, blues singer and Brunswick recording artist. Uh, she had become a big blues recording artist in the 1920s, was nationally known, uh, and she has a special connection to Knoxville because uh, about Eight years later, she was performing in New York, uh, and I think it was the year after that this, that she performed at uh, from Spirituals to Swing at uh, Carnegie Hall in, in New York, which is a great big. It was a major series of uh, of uh, African American recordings that they were made there. Uh, but she uh, but she had a stroke in 1945, and uh, and it ended her her regular uh, singing career. And she moved in with her daughter, uh, who was a school teacher who happened to live. In Knoxville, Tennessee. Mm -hmm. So she actually she was from Georgia originally, but moved Georgia. actually moved here mm -hmm. in 1945. Spent the last 22 years of her life here in Knoxville. So she's buried at uh, New Gray Cemetery on, on Western. Yeah, her daughter let me borrow some of her early albums that, okay. uh, to to hear the kind of music she was doing. Yeah, and because uh, she said she did appear at the gym theater. What, what do you remember about her daughter? I, I, I never met her. Well, her daughter was, um, uh, her name's escaping me right now, but she came to the back center several times. And she lived on Louise Avenue, not far from the back center. And she uh, always came to talk about her mother and, and her career. So it's quite interesting. Yeah, the, uh, uh, Ida Cox was coaxed up to, she never made an album. Of course, the albums were not a, a thing in the 1920s, but. Uh, her first album was one she made when she lived here, and it was called uh, "Blues from Rampart Street." Uh, and uh, it was, and she went up to New York to make it with the Coleman Hawkins Quintet. Uh, and uh, and uh, the album in my yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, it's uh, it's great that at the time, the last few years of her life, she sang here only as a member of the uh, Patton Street Church, Church of God. Church of God. Mm -hmm. That's right. But I, I, I'd heard that she performed at the gym, but had never seen the evidence of it until we saw until we saw these. And she was here several several years in a row. Uh, and you see Ida Cox, Queen of the Blues uh, singer. Um, but um, yeah. twelve high brown girls. <laughs> yeah. 
Okay. And Lord Jordan, of course, in his 1035, you know there were five or six of those people, and they sounded just like a big band. And he, too, was one of those people who made a western. He went out west and rode horses and shot guns and all that kind of stuff. So he's the only other one, a big star I know of, who participated in a Western movie. He was a mainly noted saxophonist and band leader and, uh, and a uh, singer, right? He did, didn't he do Caledonia? Caledonia, yeah. 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 make sure big head so hard. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, uh, this, was, uh, this is one of very few uh, ads for actual movies at, at the gym that we've seen. And uh, like I say, the, the ads in the newspapers were mainly aimed at white people. And they didn't expect white people to see movies at the gym theater, but uh, but this was one that they thought might be an exception. I'm not sure if this movie was shown. It was a musical comedy, I think, despite the forbidding name Beware. I think it was a, 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 a funny comedy, and I've, I haven't seen it, but I've heard people say it's underrated and a fascinating kind of catalog of. It, it might be his western movie. I'm not sure. It may be the western movie that he did. Yeah. But uh, yeah. next, please, the real. Um, yeah. yeah. Now, this is, of course, quite interesting where Hollywood attempted to make uh, black people more human in, in with their portrayals. This is a later edition of Imitation of Life. The first one came out in 1934 when it starred Claudette Colbert and Looney's Beavers, I believe. And this one has uh, Juanita Moore in the black robe and uh, Lana Turner uh, with Mahalia Jackson singing at the black character's funeral. You know, so I, I've seen both of these movies. Yeah, yeah, they're considered groundbreaking at the time. Yeah, they, they were. Even Sandra D is in it. Uh, yeah. And, and Susan Conner is in there. I think she played the part, she was white, but she played a black role. I think that may be the one where she was trying to pass for white. You know, I get these movies mixed up now. I haven't seen either one of them in such a long time, but that's what it was all about. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I wonder if this showed at the, at the, at the, uh, at the White Theater on Gay Street. Uh, next one, please. Teenage Millionaire. This was uh, uh, <laughs> this is Jackie Wilson. Yeah. Sensational guy on the stage, Mr. Excitement. <laughs> uh, yeah. He cut so many great tunes. In fact, he had a stroke on the stage, mm -hmm. heart attack. He was in a nursing home for quite some time before he died. Yeah. He, he performed here some, uh, I, I, think at, uh, I think he did a show at Caswell Park at one time in, in the late 50s, maybe. Yeah, he, he was one with an operatic voice. Uh, yeah, I've seen him on Ed Sullivan. Yeah. But he, anyway, yeah, Teenage Millionaire, it, it, it sounds like it was uh, kind of uh, just, a, just a fun uh, comedy for, uh, for, uh, for kids. But it's amazing. <laughs> this might be a good trivia question. Uh, who, who, what movie has uh, Jackie Wilson, Rocky Graziano, and, uh, and Zazu Pitts <laughs> all in the same, all the same movie? Yeah. All right. Next one, please. That's the image. Yeah. That, that's the last image. Okay. Uh, well, next we have uh, we have a little film uh, of the civil rights era, and uh, and, there's, and and Bob has a little cameo appearance in the middle of it. Look look for him. Um, but we uh, we uh, we're going to show it, and Bob, you, you're welcome to comment on anything you you see. Uh, but I think it'd just be interesting to to, to show it. It's silent, so you can talk over it. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. This this is the beginning of the city and movement, beginning of the city and movement from Susan Knoxville College. And these are just some slides, that, pictures that were taken by the Knoxville News Sentinel. There I am in jail, and the dean of men with the glasses on came to get me out. <laughs> Never did so few cook up so much excitement. Well, the excitement was in the streets and not yeah. on the screen, as if I didn't get it.
Yeah, is that the Tennessee? Well, uh, one of Tennessee yeah, all the way up here. I'm not sure yeah, which one. It looks like the Tennessee, I yeah, guess. Yes. Yeah, Tennessee was segregated for 35 years and uh, was was rarely challenged, to my knowledge. They had occasional events when they would allow in uh, uh, black school children or something, but it was mainly an all-white theater. You know, what, what's interesting, I think the first black person to ever perform there was one of my high school classmates, Price Michael, who sang on the talent show there in 1953. Really? And that may have been the first black person to perform at the Tennessee Theater on stage. I wouldn't doubt it. Jim? And Helms was right where we are right now, but that's uh, that was the cafe that was right here. What year is that? 1963, probably. Is that sound right, Bob? Uh, this looks like 1963. Uh, I had gone by then. I was work teaching in Chattanooga, so I had gone. And this was after I left. But, but you started something before you left, didn't you? Yeah, I, I did. I was in Bond before I left. Yeah, they're singing and, and clapping and just being turned down for yeah, uh, buying a ticket. Going up to the ticket when they're asking for a ticket, which they weren't going to get. <laughs> Yeah, all this is 1963. In case these students, and also college students, have a lot to do with, uh, with the desegregation of downtown Knoxville. Mm -hmm. And it's mostly peaceful, but these characters on the left look like they didn't want it to be, maybe. <laughs> Knoxville College was originally black and white, was it not? Yeah, it was, it was a black. And then it went segregated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Black. It was, it was well, no, it was, it was mainly a, a black college. They had a few exceptions in there. No, I know, but I mean, it, it, there were black and white, and then early 20th century it went all black. Well, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was a state statute, right? Yeah, the state law of 1901 said that no blacks and whites could go to school together in, in any classroom, right. private or public. So that so anything left was split. Anything black and white prior to that, after Plessy Ferguson, became segregated. After that. Well, well, in, well, in education, Knoxville College had always taught blacks and whites together, as did Maryville College. Maryville College had taught black people since 1819 when it was founded, but that state law of 1901 outlawed the mixing of races in classrooms. Yeah. And you also had it in rock concerts, you had it in dances, I think you mentioned one time ago. Yeah. I well, mean, you'd, you'd have dances, you'd have like, not only boys on one side, girls on, but you'd have blacks on one side and boys and, and whites on the other. So it was never, like, you know, I heard of concerts here that, you know, popular rock concerts well, well, that were black and white. Really, all of that was left up to the proprietor mm -hmm because the law of 1875, which put us in segregation, didn't even mention black people. It said that the proprietor of a business has the right to refuse service to anyone. That, and that meant that black people couldn't stay in hotels, couldn't eat at restaurants, couldn't go to movies, couldn't ride stagecoaches, couldn't ride ferries, if the proprietor did not want them to ride. And, and the state law provided that no proprietor could be taken to a state court. If I were to protest and say, look, you don't admit me because I'm black, I couldn't take them to court. Mm -hmm. The state laws, the state courts wouldn't hear the case. So that was a state law in 75, not yeah. a federal? It was a, 
while the state law was in answer to the federal law, the federal law of 1875 gave black people those rights to eat in restaurants, stay in hotels, uh, eat, do whatever. And the state law said, uh-uh, not too fast, folks. So they passed their segregation laws without mentioning black people. In fact, it, it's not called the Jim Crow law because it didn't mention blacks. You would think that meant people who were drunk, boisterous, wouldn't they, dirty, whatever, but it was aimed at blacks without mentioning blacks. So that's what happened for 90 plus years. And that would be Tennessee, right? Tennessee state law was that. And I'm sure Alabama, Georgia, Mississippi, and the rest did the very same thing. Yeah, then just so I'm, I'm sure they all mirrored each other. Yes. Yeah. Well, another question back there, Mary Paul? Yeah, how well attended were the white performances for white people that didn't theater? Mm -hmm. Were they popular with the white community? You get the question. Uh, the, the question is about how with the gym, a lot of white people did come to shows at the gym theater. Would, do we have any any anecdotes or data about that? I, I don't think so. But I know even during my period of attending the gym theater, white people always came. Not many, but two or three maybe walked in because they wanted to see a movie, and they were they were needed. Who was the distributor for Gem? Was it well, the it, major studio? Well, it was owned by the Bijou Amusement Company. So I guess whoever furnished the Bijou and other theaters around, there were several in that chain. So I, I have no idea, but it was owned by the Bijou Amusement Company. Okay. Because it, it would seem to me that any business, uh, like the Bijou or the Gem, would want as many people to fill the seats so they can pay their mortgage. Not really. <laughs> and pay their bills. No, that, that wasn't the way they thought in those days. <laughs> well, well, so what? The now, some of the thinking was if I let those people in, I'm going to lose some of my other customers. So, I mean, so. Oh, I, I see what. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, okay. Because that's what we had to experiment I in see. the city of I see. Would integration of the lunch calendars harm the businesses? Would my people continue to come? And, and it's very interesting to me because I. During the city and movement at Richard's department store, there was an empty seat between two white fellows, and I sat down. They paid me no mind. One had ordered a hamburger. When the hamburger came, he asked me to pass the salt. Passed him the salt. And then I said, excuse me, mister, but do you object to sitting beside a Negro? He said, I sure as hell do, buddy, and got him to move. <laughs> I mean, a number of things like that. Well, yeah. people hadn't thought about that. Yeah. yeah. But you know. So I guess in the way, of, like the gym, it had to it had to stay in business. So it had not only had to to seek patronage from the black community it was in, but also from the whites. If it could draw from the white community, you know. The fatter, the you know. Yeah. Well, I agree, but it, but it didn't have that many white patrons. It, no. it, 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 those who came, I think, may have been friends of the manager or whatever. And people just trickled in, but there was no eight or ten white people walking into the gym there. You saw one or two or three, maybe. I've heard some some shows like the, when Noble Sissel was in town in the in the twenties or thirties. There was a I, I heard I saw one random. Thing that there were a lot of white people who went to that show at the yeah, gym. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Which are yeah. general yeah. movies. Yeah, general movies. Yeah, they, they did. Yeah. They didn't yeah. So we have, we have a question back there. Yeah, was the price, the pricing between the gym and the beach view, and also, I mean, since you're having to sit in substandard seating, did you pay substandard price? Um, no, you paid the same <laughs> price. You know, uh, you know, it's like people who were riding the trains in those days that were segregated. You rode in a cattle car, but you still paid first class fares. And that was the same thing with the beach. We said way up at the top, everybody paid the same thing. Yeah, but. Um, uh, you mentioned the movie that caught my attention, the movie I Passed for White. I was curious, like, if that, if you said maybe it would have played at the gym, because just in researching the exhibit on Eastern Tennessee cinema, the lead actress, the white woman who plays the black woman who's supposedly passing for white, 
uh, Sonia Wild, I think her name is. Jake Butcher's wife, that's right. Yeah, married Jake Butcher, so I thought that was an interesting connection. <laughs> Uh, but I was curious, do you, do you remember, did it play at the gym, or? No, I don't remember that, but as I said, I remember Pinky, uh, the actress, white actress, Jean Crane, played a black girl who was passing for white in Pinky, okay. and her grandmother was Ethel Waters. And also, it lost the license, you saw Mel Ferrer, who was a white actor playing a black actor who was <laughs> passing for white. So in 1949, there was a spate of those movies that with, with black people passing for white. Yes. Yeah. Yes. What do you, what can you tell me about the Park Theater? You haven't mentioned it. I haven't mentioned it because the Park Theater was a segregated theater until about the very end. And I think I went there two times, or maybe three times. I think the first movie I saw there was Earthquake with Charleston Heston. And the movie was, was so small and the, the sound system was so heavy, I thought the theater was going to fall down every time the earthquake rumbled. But uh, there, there's, it was the Park Theater because it was in Park City. It was a white theater. I, I'm not sure. Jack, we got right here when it was a set. movies there when I was a child. Yeah, yeah. That, it, it, it's funny about that because the Tennessee Theater had always been the first run theater where the big blockbuster movies would come through first until the early 1960s when suddenly the, the sound of music and everything else, they, that showed at the Park Theater first in the Middle East Hospital. That was, the, that was the, the park and then the Capri too were kind of the two suburban theaters that showed movies the first time. The, the park theater, the movie theater in East Knoxville opened in 1938. It was located on Magnolia at the corner of Olive Street. I that saw Hello Dolly there. You did. I saw Patton and Jaws, I think was the last one I saw there. Uh, sir, yeah. were there any uh, coordination in the sit-ins of Knox College with any white organizations, churches, individuals? Well, the coordination between Knoxville College students and the sit-in movement and churches, the Unitarian Church was very much plugged into it. Uh, of course, all the black churches were, but the white pastors, uh, gave support from the sidelines, but not many white churches participated. There were some groups from some of the white churches, especially women, who were observers on the scene who could report what was going on when things got out of kilter. But there was not that much support from the church community during the city of movement. And what was the worst violent incident that happened in that? Well, you see, I, I never saw any, but there were people who had cokes thrown on them, they, people who were hit by salt shakers, maybe. And there, there was a stink bomb uh, set loose uh, in front of the theater the night I was arrested in 1961. I never saw any of that. I never saw or heard of any violence, but there was some. But, but the city of Knoxville said, we're not going to have that here. And Mayor Duncan assigned police officers who understood what was going on so things would not get out of hand. So we didn't have the problem that they had in Birmingham and Selma and other places because no police dogs were going to be sicked on people, no fire hoses were going to be turned on because Mayor Duncan and former Mayor Cass Walker and former Mayor Joyce Dempson said, we don't want that in our city. But Mayor Duncan told me that a governor, maybe of South Carolina or Mississippi, I'm not sure which, called him and asked him why he was allowing those sit-ins to take place. Aren't you a southern city? And he said, yes, we're a southern city, but we don't want the problems here that we're having in your state. And as long as people are peaceful, we're going to let them protest. So that was the attitude of Mayor John Duncan and, and other leaders in this city. Yeah. Were you quite uh, opposition people re arrested? Uh, as far as I know, the, the night I was arrested, 51 people were arrested. One white fellow was arrested. He was the one who threw the stink bomb that I didn't know anything about. But it, it's in the newspaper article, so that's 
that's all that I know. I have a couple more questions. <laughs> I, 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 I think he has two, but yeah, go ahead. Where was Riches? Was it over on Hanley? Yeah, Riches was uh, what really became Miller's and later, still later became Hess's. Uh, Riches was the big, it's now the UT Conference Center. Yeah, that, that was, uh, it was a fancy, big fancy department store that was based in Atlanta. And they were, they, they opened in 1956 and they claimed to be ultra modern. And they were ultra modern in every respect. They were so modern that when they opened in 1956, they didn't cut the uh, yellow, the, the ribbon. Uh, they, they, they disintegrated it with uh, a nuclear charge uh, with, uh, with Oak, Ridge, Oak Ridge scientists watching and ensuring everybody that it was, uh, that it was, uh, that it was safe. But, but they were not modern in one respect in that they were, they were segregated. Their lunch counter was, was segregated. I remember the internet building. Where was the, the counter? Was it on the first floor? Uh, do you know what? Remember the lunch counter? Some of the lunch counters were on the in the basement. I don't remember the Miller the mil on the gate street upstairs. Upstairs. Well, they had two. They had one on. They had two. Yeah, they had the law room upstairs, which was a fancy. Yeah, yeah. They had the law room upstairs. Yeah, they had the law room upstairs. Yeah, they had the law room upstairs, which was a fancy lunch room. That was the one we wanted to desegregate. Yeah, and it's it's interesting that Richards closed right after this demonstration, and it became Miller's uh, when Miller's expanded and had a second downtown store. I don't know if the, if the uh, activism here had something to do with them withdrawing to just their Atlanta store or, or not. Uh, yeah, okay, over here. Uh, yeah, when I was a child growing up in Clinton, uh, I went into the gym. What was the Rich Theater was there? And I was really upset because they wouldn't let me up, sit up. <laughs> I wanted to sit up there because I thought it'd be cool. <laughs> go. So I got discriminated against. Paul, you told you couldn't sit up there. He just said you can't sit up there. Because I'd go to the Tennessee and I always wanted to sit in the balcony because I just thought that was cool and I was told I wasn't allowed to sit up well, there. Well, they might have been closed because I don't know if they ever had a black balcony at the Tennessee Theater. No, no, no. I, they, if the theater weren't full, uh, they didn't want to manage the balcony, so that's why they asked to sit up you know, on the main floor. Yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, I want to thank uh, Mr. Neely and Mr. Buckner for. I was going to wrap this up, but uh, you guys, will you hang around for a few minutes if anyone has a question? And I just want to mention, you were talking about riches there. I want to just point to the McClung uh, digital collection online where you can go and see some photographs. Uh, not just that, there are thousands of photos up there, including a lot of the ones we saw today. And the, the ribbon cutting or ribbon exploding that Jack talked about is on Tamas's Vimeo page. Oh, okay. There's actually footage of it when it did it, 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 It's uh, pretty interesting. And of course, if you hear, uh, if you want to learn more about the history of uh, theaters and movie making in East Tennessee, you're welcome to go down to the museum. And there's a video of Mr. Booker talking uh, even more. So uh, it's a great thank show. you all for coming. And, yeah.